Today, I've opted to speak on the topic, the political economy of structural transformation has democracy failed African economies. I'm quite sure that uh, not many people are used to hearing me talk about politics, but uh, I think we've gotten to a point in our uh, lives as Africans where we cannot escape the, the need to talk about the politics of our region and how that affects the development or the fortunes of the region. It's important that we put Africa into the right perspective. It's a region that today uh, is seen by many as having made some very decent progress in the last decade. But not too long ago, uh, 2009, the economist was describing it as a hopeless uh, continent. And then not long after that, we, in 2011, <coughs> When some optimism came into this, into the scene, we saw Africa rising, and another two years later, the aspiring, uh, the uh, Africa. So clearly, the way in which the world sees Africa has changed, or is changing. Um, one thing remains, however. So even though the narrative may be changing in terms of how African governments are seen by the world, there is also the other side, that uh, with every marginal change that you see, there is something else that may be less understood and less positive for the people that live in the region. I've chosen to talk about this, and uh, my talk is motivated by three uh, experiences that I've had in the last uh, two decades. The first is the, my experience with the economic reforms in Ghana, uh, which began around 1983. So after doing it for uh, about nine years, we then opted uh, to replace the military regime that brought in the reforms with an elected government in 1992. So many of us, were quite uh, worried about how the transition was going to be made. Uh, we watched how in preparation for the first elections under the fourth Republican constitution, uh, government began to spend and spend and spend that, like there was no tomorrow. And uh, of course, that meant that soon after the elections in 1993, the economy was in complete mess an economy that had taken almost a decade to stabilize was in a complete mess. So in 1993, uh, the government organized uh, a meeting with all the donors to see how best we could change the uh, situation. Uh, I was lucky to be invited to the meeting and I listened to the uh, Minister of Finance explain how donors had forced the government to have elections as a result of the uh, way they had to have elections to legitimize policies and so on, uh, had, had no choice. And then the World Bank vice president at the time responded, we didn't ask you to win the elections. We only said, have ele we didn't ask you to win. So it was the process of trying to win the election that created a huge deficit that took almost four years to fix. So that was my first experience. African governments having elections and the strong desire to win the elections. And as a result of that, more or less destroying so many gains from almost a decade. But I've watched Ghana do that almost every four years. Uh, so it happened in 96, it happened in uh, 2000 and so on. And the same thing happens. So, it doesn't happen only in Ghana, it happens in almost every African country where there, there are elections. So you spend a lot of time fixing, stabilizing the economy, and you use a year to destroy it. So that's my first experience. The second one that also motivates uh, this talk came from my first visit ever to Ethiopia. I was invited in 1994 by the Ethiopian Economic Association to share with them my experience as a Ghanaian living through the reforms in Ghana. 
So I gave what I thought was a very nice talk. And in, in my talk, I spoke about the need for reforms. I did emphasize land tenure reforms. Of course, as I spoke, the prime minister was there. So I thought he was enjoying himself. So later on, when he got up to speak, he said to my hearing, there will never be a change in our land tenure system so long as I remain prime minister. I mean, of course, coming from a democratic Ghana, I was wondering, what, what's going on here? How can a prime minister say that so long as I remain prime minister, there's going to be no change? You know, it gave me an insight into how strong leaders in Africa uh, rule. It gave me an understanding that there will be no change so long as I, the strong man, remain in power. My third experience, which also prompt, uh, influences what I'm going to say today, Earlier this year, I was in uh, Kigali for the next Einstein Forum. Um, and uh, I'd been to Kigali 10 years earlier, and I saw the huge contrast. Kigali has changed so much. Uh, it was more beautiful, neat. Uh, I saw many more tall buildings, and I saw uh, disciplined people uh, behaving like uh, in uh, Helsinki. They wouldn't cross the road. <laughs> you know, so I said, what's going on here? I looked at the uh, economic performance data, and it showed a lot of promise. You know, this year they expected 6.8% growth, you know, 6.1% last year, and before 8.6%. So clearly, something was going right in Kigali. Clearly, something good was happening there. And of course, I heard many of the Africans there saying, this is what every African leader must do. This is what must happen throughout Africa. This kind of change is what we need. But then someone also said, well, they may be doing this, but they're not democratic. And I remember they've had elections. They had elections not too long ago. Yeah, but they had to change the constitution for the president to run again for the third time, for another seven-year term. So clearly, there's something good happening in Rwanda, but it's not democratic. What does it mean for our understanding of uh, democracy and how democracy influences the way economies are supposed to perform? So these three things have uh, encouraged me to think that democracy um, is not something that um, you treat lightly. There are aspects of it that may be exciting and there may be other aspects that may be not so exciting. So as an economist, let me see how to probe into that. So that's how, uh, if you don't understand anything at all from this lecture, you remember my three experiences, and uh, I think you'll be fine. So basically, uh, as we typically would do, uh, I, I will talk about the unchanging structure of Africa's economies and explain why, why the, uh, the, the absence of structural transformation. Then I will talk a little bit about how policies are made in the region and how uh, basically, the, 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 those uh, changes in terms of the way policy is made uh, may, could possibly influence uh, our interest in long-term outcomes. And I will talk about the new political environment, the environment in which uh, Africa, African governments experience uh, pluralism, um, an experience in which uh, many Africans have a voice in the who, who rules their country, or does not rule their country, and what it means for structural transformation. And then I will conclude after that. So the main argument that I'll be making today uh, is that uh, if economic management efforts of the last several decades have not led to transformation, it's not simply a question of whether democracy and associated practices are good for Africa. Uh, it goes beyond that question. That's basically my point. Uh, the main argument is African governments have not adapted democracy appropriately for the purpose of building institutions that generate the reforms to support structural transformation. So you, you can be a democracy, uh, but if you don't have democratic institutions, if you do only hold elections, but you don't have the right institutions, the likelihood that you reap the benefits or the dividends from uh, democracy uh, becomes very low. So that's the point. That's even when governments express interest 
in long-term development, they manage this interest with a short-term framework, usually the budget. So they are looking for immediate outputs. Elections will be coming in another four years. So they've got a short sure results. I'll be making the point that in many countries, that's the main thing that drives decision making. I will argue that uh, appropriate policy and institutional force for structural transformation must be anchored in long-term development frameworks uh, and institutional structures. You can't pursue long-term goals with short-term strategies and short-term frameworks. Or you can't use institutions that are designed for a short-term purpose to achieve a long-term aspiration. That's, these are the main points I want to make in there. So in my introduction, uh, and I do have a very long paper that uh, I, I wrote for this. Uh, the, 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 I, I talk about the positive stories. I share the recent growth in Africa. Uh, that has been good. Um, Africa's performance in the last decade has been very, very good, and uh, that's compared to other developing regions in the, uh, around. Um, we're talking about 3.1% per capita growth. That's not bad for many economies. And that's the kind of thing that we talk about. So we talk about the, the fact that Africa has seen, have been seen as an area of promise. Uh, we talk about the fact that Africa is generally seen positively, a lot more so today than it was 20 years ago. And it's not simply growth figures showing uh, gains, uh, but a greater respect for African institutions. There were many people who would have said 20 years ago that every good gain that is reflected in the growth numbers is probably is a result of a commodity price changes. Today, we know that uh, Africa does have some very good policies that have delivered good results. Of course, I also talk about the not so positive stories. Uh, the World Bank has estimated that the Africa will be the home to the largest number of extremely poor people by 2030. Sorry, it's, it's 2030, not 2013. It's 2030. Africa will be the home to the largest number of extremely poor people by 2030. Uh, that's clearly a big problem, uh, apart from the, uh, being the home of, of poor people. It's also a place of uh, a lot of dysfunction. Uh, that's also part of the challenges that Africa needs to be confronted with. Uh, poverty, apart from increasing inequality, is also going to increase. Uh, these are the kind of challenges that Africa is talking about. Of course, I introduced in introduction some of the striker debates. Can Africa survive with that striker transformation? What the arguments, like the Roderick type of position, others. Um, can Africa really move on, continue achieving decent growth rates without changing the structure of its economies? Uh, we'll be taking a position that no. And then I uh, discuss striker adjustment and after. Uh, did we simply learn to survive? There were a number of many African finance ministers who would argue that they've learned to fight fires. A lot of what we do in terms of managing the economy is fighting fires. And we're fighting fires since 1983. Are we still going to continue fighting fires? Did we learn something? Yes, we did learn something. We learned how to stabilize our economies. Today, if you look at every typical African economy, uh, compared to, let's say, at the time the AERC was being created, uh, every central bank in the region, or almost every central bank in the region, knows how to stabilize after the elections. You know, so, so you know that, it, you know, you know that uh, it would take you four years to repair things, it would take you one year to uh, spoil it. So the, the central bankers have conditioned themselves for it. They know how to deal with it. Similarly, finance ministry officials know how to uh, do good budgets. So, we, we, so how, what have we learned from that process we talk about it? And then I talk about leadership and institutions. Uh, when Barack Obama came to Ghana, his first trip to Africa, uh, he, made, he made mention of the fact that what Africa needs, uh, a good institutions, strong institutions, not strong men. Uh, it's, it's one that we test. Is it the case that Africa needs strong institutions and not strong men? How do strong men function uh, without strong institutions? And uh, can strong institutions function without strong men. How do, we, how do we define who a strong man is? Is Paul Kagame a strong man? Probably. Uh, there are many other uh, strong men in the region who may not have achieved the 
kind of results that uh, Prokagami has achieved. So I spent quite a bit of time on the unchanging structure of the economy. Uh, here, the, that's what the discussion is about the uh, contribution to GDP growth from agriculture, uh, how this is changing or not changing. changing. Uh, we talk about agriculture and ad employment. Uh, we discuss the issue of uh, migration and uh, pain by rural urban development. We also look at things like uh, the changes in the uh, uh, strength of the industrial and the service sectors in relation to agriculture. And of course, there's a bit of discussion about uh, the demographics uh, that you find over there. The important thing uh, is the call for more inclusive uh, growth and how to make this sustainable. Uh, we, we, we discussed that and we talk about the new interest in structural transformation. You will see that I'll do, I will mention quite extensively uh, the work that uh, uh, Justin Lin has done. So this chart is basically to show that uh, the, the, uh, unlike in the past when Africa's performance was always well beyond, uh, below what the other regions of the world were doing, uh, today, Africa basically sometimes uh, does better than the rest of the world. Uh, uh, that's only marginally worse than the rest of the world. So clearly, Africa has learned something about how to uh, manage its growth uh, uh, performance. Uh, the bit about the sector contribution to GDP shows where uh, in other parts of the world, the contribution of agriculture is declining over time. Uh, in Africa, we've seen a marginal decline um, happen. Uh, but what's the interesting thing about Africa's case is the fact that uh, when that decline uh, took place or is taking place, uh, it's not going to the places where you expect that to go. You don't, you don't find people moving from agriculture into industry as manufacturing. Uh, what you will be discussing is uh, the move from agriculture into informal activities, like in the service sector. And uh, that's something that we, we, we talk about. So this chart here basically shows uh, how important agriculture is to the African economy compared to other uh, regions. So that, that's the a point that we make quite a bit of in, in, in the presentation. So here you see uh, the contribution of agriculture, uh, forestry and fishing uh, across the uh, different uh, regions. Uh, and for Africa, it's uh, much more important than it is to other parts uh, of the world. Then we look at the uh, contribution of agriculture to uh, employment, total employment. Uh, you see how for uh, all of the, uh, the world, uh, agriculture is uh, declining. For Africa, it's also declining, but it remains very, very high. Uh, the rate of decline is not nearly as high as uh, in uh, other parts uh, of the world. So we make that point in, in our paper. Uh, quite uh, strongly. Uh, again, we look at the composition of uh, the contribution of agriculture to industry, uh, uh, of industry to total employment. Uh, we do make that uh, uh, comparison. And then we discuss the contribution of services to total employment uh, in Africa. What is important is the fact that uh, uh, Africa clearly is uh, missing that middle section, um, the industrial sector. We, so we are seeing a shift in total employment uh, from agriculture, um, not as fast as is required, but that shift is not benefiting uh, industry. Uh, it's going into the informal sector. It's the kind of thing that leads Roderick to talk about the uh, reversals in the transformational growth. Um, is that something that we need to pay attention to? I believe we should. And of course, we're talking about how to do that. How do we explain the absence of structural transformation? Uh, it's important, like, largely because uh, many African governments are quite keen to change this, the, the narrative. They are quite keen to change the story about uh, uh, what is happening to different sectors. Uh, so they are, they are, do, they are making, doing their best to uh, promote industry. Um, of course, they do this through various schemes. They do this through uh, the creation of uh, export production zones and uh, providing various incentives for um, companies to uh, bring in some FDI and so on. Uh, but it's not giving the kind of results that uh, governments are looking for. Uh, at, at what have we made to explain this? Is it the lack of uh, infrastructure, uh, especially electricity? Is that is a matter of weak institutions? 
Uh, is it the business environment? So, so many things have been written about why Africa does not uh, excite uh, industrialists, whether from within or from outside. Um, what this chart does is show us the enormity of the problem with respect to electricity access. Uh, clearly, Africa uh, is uh, well be behind all the other places. Uh, there's an estimate of 40% of the population that have only have access. So rural areas are worse off. Uh, trying to locate your industry anywhere in rural Africa becomes a huge problem, largely in view of the uh, uh, situation there. Alan Gelb and his people have done some studies into why it's difficult to do business in Africa. Uh, they talk about corruption, they talk about high cost of power, they talk about you know, non-enforcement of contracts, uh, they talk about poor security and transport infrastructure, as well as uh, policy uncertainty. Uh, you, but policy uncertainty used, probably used to be a more important problem in the 80s than it is uh, today. Uh, that's the position that uh, I, I would take on that. So, of course, it's a whole theory uh, that expects a lot of convergence uh, following the, the work of people like Solow and others. Um, we, do, we discussed quite extensively in the paper the, the absence of convergence. Um, we, we, we talk about how divergence has become the issue and why today we see a, a growing gap between uh, the developed world and the uh, uh, less developed world. Uh, how do we explain that? In those discussions, things like the role of the state become important. Um, should the African state take, play a more direct role, uh, the kind of role that Justin Lin talks about, or should it be a lot more uh, uh, controlled in what it does? What kind of institutions do you need to uh, foster convergence? What kind of institution do you need to strengthen the capacity of African industry uh, to produce and be more productive? That's the kind of uh, discussion that uh, we see more and more in the literature. Of course, here, uh, I'm not going to go through this, the whole of this slide. I mean, largely, it's, it was largely for Justin Lin's benefit. Uh, I don't know if he's in the room today. Is Justin here? No, okay. So basically, just to assure him that uh, the things he writes about are read, and uh, uh, we read them and uh, we, we critique them also. So this is largely uh, focused on things like what the state should be doing uh, in the area of trying to remove the rigidities that make it difficult for people to, uh, industry to locate in Africa. Uh, quite extensive, uh, we, we talk about uh, basically uh, the role that the, the state should be playing, uh, how far should the state go, how far should the state not go. All of that is discussed in these two uh, slides. One of the One of the points that uh, I try to make uh, in trying to explain the absence of structural transformation uh, is the fact that uh, uh, today there are many things that uh, African governments uh, can do as a result of the reforms that they pursued uh, in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, one important one that uh, I, I talk about is the fact that uh, the public financial management system in most countries uh, receive considerable attention. Um, so the, the way in which the budget is prepared, the link between the budget and various other things that the government wants to pursue, uh, especially in the short term, uh, uh, improve considerably. Um, so we spent a bit of time in the paper about how the budgetary processes uh, improved in most African countries uh, to the extent that uh, today th there's enough evidence about uh, uh, the quality of the budget uh, improving as a result of these changes that have taken place. Um, one point that I make in the discussion of the budgetary processes is the fact that uh, even though they've improved, they've improved considerably uh, in the uh, last two decades, there's very little evidence that they do influence the kinds of decisions that need to be made on, uh, when it comes to structural transformation. Uh, there's very little link between the budget and the longer term frameworks that are required for making the changes that we do talk about. So that's a point that uh, uh, we make. Here, uh, this chart showing the uh, index of uh, 
quality of budgetary and the financial management. Uh, basically, the point here is that uh, for Africa, which is uh, uh, the lower one, uh, we've seen some improvement at the same time that for other developing countries, we see a worsening uh, of the uh, quality of their budget. And, but what is interesting is that it's still worse than in uh, the other places. That's the point that we make with this chart here. Um, the, the, this chart shows how things like transparency and others have improved uh, in Africa. Uh, the accountability and dealing with corruption, uh, the, the, the state being able to talk freely about corruption as a problem. The, the clear indications that uh, uh, there's more transparency. Uh, we talk about the fact in Uganda, um, in South Africa, they publish a full set of aid budget documents. There are no budget documents that are, countries are uh, obliged to uh, uh, publish. And uh, Uganda seems to be doing very well. I don't know whether Luis has anything to do with that. Um, you, you never know. I mean, having, having good uh, central bank uh, uh, governors and deputy governors is always very important for these kinds of things. Their influence on the finance ministry uh, may be showing there. Botswana, Kenya, Liberia, Mozambique, and Tanzania are publishing quite a few, six or seven out of the eight that I suspected. Of course, and there are countries like uh, Equatorial Guinea uh, that do publish nothing at all. Uh, so on. So the, the, the important thing is that um, in many countries, the process of doing their budget has become a little more transparent. I do re receive uh, invitations every now and again from the finance ministry in Ghana to sit in uh, uh, meetings to discuss workshops to discuss the, the budget, uh, what, go what should go in and what should not go in. Uh, clearly, a lot more transparent. In almost every African country today, you will find radio stations that uh, devote time to discussing the budget, what goes into the budget, and they query uh, why particular roads are going to be paid for for the budget and not uh, others. Um, so the, the, the issue of transparency and how it is fostered accountability uh, is very important. The extent to which it leads to a reduction in corruption is yet to be tested. Um, but clearly, if people know more about what's in the budget, the likelihood of it's having an effect. So you're not going to be financing projects uh, uh, that uh, do not exist in, in the past. There they were projects that were always found uh, in the budget, but they never uh, got uh, any, in, anywhere. So there's a lot of transparency uh, taking place. So then I move to having learned from how to do budgets. Uh, how is this affecting the way we, we pursue uh, long-term change. Uh, that's where I go to this last section, this section five, the new political environment uh, and planning for structural transformation. Uh, beyond the Washington consensus, so beyond what we agreed with the World Bank to do, beyond what we agreed with the IMF to do, beyond what we agreed with DFID and uh, GDZ and all those other agencies to do, what do African countries want? The African Union, uh, has set forth the Agenda 2063 with the aspiration towards a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Uh, almost every African country that I've uh, paid attention to uh, does have a program, a medium-term program, and in that program, uh, whether it's the, uh, a, a poverty reduction strategy or something similar, uh, that program talks about two things, uh, whether the uh, serious about them or not, it's another matter. But they always talk about modernizing agriculture. Every African country talks about modernizing agriculture. Uh, and then they also talk about industrialization. You know, they, they, so they talk about these two things. Oh, clearly, these are long-term things uh, that uh, uh, you want to pursue. And I've made the point that uh, talking about modernizing agriculture without investing in agriculture uh, is they're not going to really yield the kind of outcomes that you are looking for. Um, the chart on the right uh, clearly shows you the agricultural share of government expenditure by region. So we compare Africa to other places. Uh, what you see here is, is the fact that uh, the, the share, the, what Af agriculture gets from the state uh, is much, much less than uh, in other parts of the world. Interestingly, uh, we have the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, 
which commits all African governments to devote at least 10% of their annual national budget to agriculture in pursuit of the MDGs uh, at the time. Uh, what is interesting is the fact that uh, only Malawi, Malawi uh, was able to achieve uh, that target. When it comes to industrialization, uh, as it's again for agriculture, most developed blueprints, blueprints in Africa have a strong interest in manufacturing and value-added uh, production. Um, the main thing that they do in this regard is to provide some tax incentives and they provide infrastructure for these uh, EPZs that uh, you find in many different places. I do mention the fact in the paper that uh, industrial policy, uh, which basically reflects the way the state wants to intervene uh, in markets to allow uh, or provide incentive for the functioning of the, in, of the industrial sector, um, you don't find it anywhere. Uh, there, are very, there are a number of countries that have talked about industrial policy and do have a document that they call industrial policy, uh, but very seldom do you find the kinds of arguments uh, for particular investments to be made the way that uh, 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 one would anticipate. Uh, yesterday, I was very privileged to listen to uh, John Page and, and his team uh, present the paper on uh, industrialization, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, without uh, smokestacks, right? That's what uh, John and his team uh, were pursuing. And I agreed with uh, most of the orientation of that paper uh, in terms of uh, um, looking at other sectors within the economy uh, alongside manufacturing. Uh, my only concern, of course, John, was that uh, the, the uh, story about manufacturing got lost. So, so uh, it sounded almost like uh, Africa can industrialize without manufacturing. And I, I wasn't surprised that uh, Justin Lin uh, was up in arms. Uh, the, the, the important thing that we want to pursue here is that uh, Africa needs to have a clearly stated industrial policy. What goes into that industrial policy she be informed country, country by the uh, states of uh, things in that country. The type of institutions that you have, the human capital available, uh, the challenges that are, are, are provided by nature, and so on. Uh, these are the things that should be going into industrial policy. And I have no difficulty at all uh, um, supporting things like uh, subsidies. I, I have no difficulty with picking winners. The most important thing I would emphasize is knowing how to pick the winners, knowing how to pick the right winners. And I know that uh, as a result of the, uh, uh, getting our fingers burned in the 1960s and 1970s, when we're doing the import of social industrialization, everybody has run away from picking winners instead of learning how to pick winners. And that's a point that I, I do make quite a bit of uh, in, in the paper. So I have no difficulty uh, with uh, uh, picking winners so long as we do that properly. In the last discussion that we will have, we'll talk about democracy and economic decision making. Um, African countries saw considerable um, instability, political instability in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Uh, we talk about the number of coup d'etat that uh, uh, took place in the region. And, uh, after they went through struggle adjustment, the number of coup d'etats that uh, occurred went down considerably. So we do talk about that. What did they learn from it? They learned from that um, the need for good governance. And that's the kind of thing that the World Bank preached quite extensively uh, in, in the 90s, good governance. Uh, the pursuit of good governance led to the elections. But today we've seen that many of the elections that were organized were largely only in name. Were largely only in name. Uh, we, we've seen countries like uh, Angola, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, the DRC, and Congo all produce elections and election results. And uh, nobody really believes them, but we do accept them because we, we have to be nice. So, so we accept these uh, results and uh, we pretend that there's democracy taking place. And when things go wrong in those countries, we blame it on the new democracy. That's one of the uh, issues that I, 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 I talk about. Um, my colleague Juma Bwedi has written about the number of electoral democracies that we have in Africa, which increased considerably after 1989, so that by uh, 2000, 
Uh, there was quite a, a good number of uh, African countries that could be described as democracies. So is there a link between Africa becoming more and more democratic, more and more, ha having more and more elections, and then the way uh, the economies perform? Uh, there are a number of uh, people that have written quite extensively about these experiences. Uh, many of them can be put under three different scenarios, what they call the conflict scenario, and then the compatibility scenario, and then the skeptical scenario. In the conflict scenario, elected officials take a short-term view about policy making. They are always thinking about the next election, as I've described to you earlier. And so most decisions that are taken will have this in mind. I do talk about countries that uh, could, be, uh, uh, could easily qualify for this. Um, indeed, um, Okay, let, let me go to the next topic, the, the compatibility scenario. Here, this is more of the, the positive relationship between uh, elections and, uh, uh, or democracy and uh, current performance. Here, the emphasis on pluralism. Uh, you still have checks and balances and the freedom of press, uh, providing safeguards against the system abuse or predatory behavior. Um, so what people are looking for is evidence of a positive relationship between the uh, elections or the democratic uh, processes and the economic performance. And of course, in the last scenario, uh, there's no relationship that can be found between uh, democracy and development. And the ones who have done studies in these, um, Simoglu is uh, one of such, and then his work clearly, uh, followed by many others, uh, shows that uh, uh, there's some positive relationship between uh, having a democracy and uh, economic performance. Uh, you talk about the fact that uh, uh, per capita GDP increased about, about 20% over the past 30 years. Uh, this translates to 0 0.6 increase in annual growth. Uh, the idea here is that democracy is more likely to lead to the protection of the rights of individuals, uh, including property rights and so on. So the argument about uh, a positive relationship between democracy and uh, performance is linked to uh, how the rights of individuals are protected and the, the way that incentive fosters their making the right economic decisions, which will lead to uh, growth. Uh, my colleague Fosu also has studied this and uh, concluded that uh, countries that have democratic regimes enjoy agricultural productivity and overall growth. Of course, there's the skeptical view, and there are quite a number of studies that have uh, uh, gone in there. Uh, in Africa, or for Africa, the, one of the best known is the work by Kisangani, 2006, published in Canada, uh, which basically looks at 37 countries and then uh, concludes uh, support the skeptical view. Uh, there are a number of these. What is important in this discussion is the fact that uh, uh, it's mixed. There are those who see a positive relationship and those who do not. I have, looking at the performance of various countries, come to the position that it doesn't really matter whether it's a matter of democracy fostering development uh, or there being no uh, strong relationship between them. This is because in most of Africa, you will find evidence of all of these. And sometimes in the same country, you will find uh, the, all three scenarios playing out. And how does it work? Let's take a country like uh, uh, Nigeria. Nigeria is a, Nigeria claims to be the largest democracy in Africa. It's the largest democracy. Has the largest population, so the largest democracy. Uh, and Nigeria does have uh, regular elections. Every four years, we do have elections. And now we've seen the elections lead to a change in government. So clearly, there's something credible about the way they run elections in Nigeria. It's the way decisions uh, get made linked to the elections. Sometimes yes, other times no. I've seen uh, Nigerian uh, governments take very radical uh, decisions. For a good example would be when the Charles Soludo decided to consolidate the banking system in Nigeria. A very, very tough decision, uh, one that most governments would have run away from, uh, effectively reducing the number of banks very significantly in a very short period. 
The Nigerian government was able to do it. And yet the Nigerian government is not able to do much about the oil industry. It's not able to control corruption. So cor corruption gets worse and worse and worse. So do you blame corruption in Nigeria on democracy or not? It's a very difficult one. Uh, we saw corruption in Nigeria under the military regime, and we've seen corruption in Nigeria under the civilian regime, under an elected regime. Does corruption play any significant role during elections? Probably not. If all the uh, uh, parties are engaged in it. So it's very difficult to see the link between democracy and outcomes in Nigeria. I take Ghana, my own country. I, there, there's no point talking about other countries, talk about my own, my own country. So let me talk about Ghana, even though it's a very risky thing to do. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things I like about Ghana is all I need to do is listen to you for five minutes and I know which party you belong to. You know, I'm, so I'm quite sure that the Ghanaians here, after five minutes, will know which party I belong to. Mm. But I'll take the risk. I'm sure they will be wrong anyway. <laughs> so Ghana has uh, changed. Uh, we, we, so we, we entered this phase of electing governments every four years. Uh, that's in 1992. And then we, 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 what, what we call the Fourth Republic. Uh, so we changed from Rollins uh, to uh, Kufo, another party. And then from Kufo, uh, we went to uh, John, it was Atamils. And then from Atamils, we went to John Mahama. And now with uh, uh, President Kufo. So, so we know how to change governments. We, we know how to, so the, the presidents know that we know how to change them. Uh, we know how to sell our votes. We know how to uh, draw out of uh, a, a candidate uh, something. So if I'm a Ghanaian and I see elections coming, I know there's a high likelihood that the road in front of my house will be fixed. Mm. I know that uh, if I need water, I, I don't need to make too much noise. Uh, I have to just simply wait for the next elections, and there's a high likelihood that it will be fixed. If uh, there's power, and indeed, everybody who knows Ghana knows very well that uh, uh, supply of power gets very, very erratic as a result of the tariff uh, arrangements that we have there, because we can't pay uh, for the production. And you know that uh, no matter how many power cuts or load sharing takes place, as elections approach, they will find a, pro a solution to the problem. So, so we know that. And, uh, so, uh, and because we know that, and the governments also know that, we've sort of come into an arrangement or an understanding that uh, uh, help me and I also help you. Help me with the infrastructure and help me, and so when you do that, I'll help you to gain power. What it means is that come elections, promises are made. And uh, the current government made quite a number of promises. Uh, it promised free senior high education. Uh, it promised every, distri every district with a new factory. Uh, it promised every village with a dam. So the, the, the people, understood that, and they liked the idea, so they voted for the government. What it means that today, the government of Ghana has to produce over 200 factories before the next elections. I mean, how is that going to work? And how do you produce these factories without an industrial policy? How do you produce, you know, when I talk about this in Ghana, uh, it's, it's, it's not looked at, uh, <laughs> Uh, but there's no Ghanaian, well, there are few Ghanaians here, but I know them, so I don't, I'm not worried. <laughs> yeah. so, so the government of Ghana seriously believes that it can produce two, more than 200 factories. Of course, I've heard people debate about what type of factory, and the people say, a factory is a factory. Yeah, but the idea behind producing, uh, promising 200 factories or more is that you, are, you want to deal with the unemployment problem. That's, that's the whole idea. So if you're going to have 200 factories that don't employ anybody, then you haven't solved the problem. So it's not simply a, an issue of a factory is a factory. You need to have the factories that can produce uh, jobs. That's the kind of dilemma. So Ghana has learned, or politicians in Ghana have learned, in my view, to make commitments of a long-term nature, like producing factories or producing dams, using short-term 
instruments should be using short-term frameworks. That's why we want to build 200 factories, but we don't have a policy on industrialization. That, for me, is a good example of the uh, conflict scenario. But the same Ghana also knows how to uh, uh, deal with uh, poverty. The same Ghana knows how to, what to do in terms of social protection. The same Ghana knows how to enhance the functioning of their public services. Today in Ghana, one of the uh, most interesting things, and I think Maxwell is here so he can confirm, uh, we're doing a lot of readjustment of the banking system, allowing banks to uh, shut down if they are not performing, and the likelihood of a run on them is very high. Allowing, so that's commitment. That's clear indication that the government knows what to do at the right time. But the same government promises 200 factories within four years. I struggle with that. We talk about things like uh, modernization of agriculture. I haven't, apart from South Africa that is trying to uh, do land tenure reform, I haven't seen any single African government try in a very serious way to do a reform of the land tenure system. And yet we know that to modernize agriculture requires considerable infusion of capital. Today, less than 4% of all investment in, in Africa, it goes into agriculture. Less than 4%. How do you change that? You're not going to change that by leaving the land tenure system intact. Something has to give. You've got to make it worth anybody's while to want to invest in agriculture through things like land consolidation. How do you do land consolidation if you don't intend to do land tenure? In Ghana, nobody talks about land tenure reforms because it's a very, it's not a nice thing to talk about. Why? Because no interest group wants to be a loser in that kind of discussion. Parliament is not going to be the forum for negotiating the interests of groups in land, under land tenure reforms. And so we talk about modernization, but no land tenure. We talk about giving every village a dam, and yet we have no policy on irrigation. We, we talk about providing free senior high schools, but we don't even discuss what should be in the curriculum. It is these things that, for me, reflect the strong uh, or, or the use of uh, uh, the inappropriate tools for dealing with long-term problems. Of course, whenever I've, I've spoken about uh, uh, the kinds of things that we want to we want to provide free senior high school, we want to finance it with the oil rents, so on. That's nice. It's nice to be able to give everybody free senior high school education using oil rents. But we also know that 10 years after these kids leave their schools, they'll be unemployed. They'll be unemployed. 10 years after they've left those schools, they'll still be unemployed. And so we have a choice. We have a choice between giving them the right skills that they can find jobs with, and the, that those right skills may come from functioning industry that will provide them with the experience they need to be ready for the job market. I wouldn't do anything about industry. So we are willing to use the oil rent to, to finance free senior high school education, but more ambivalent when it comes to using oil rents to support modernizing agriculture or uh, an industrial development program. That's where I have my difficulty. How do governments make those choices? How do they decide? That's the political economy side. How do they decide that financing free senior high school is more important? Of course, they know that free senior high school is more popular. More families are likely to be interested in the free senior high school than in supporting agriculture or than in supporting the construction of factories. So governments have found a way of making these choices. And that's the point that I make. So, that's my story. African governments do make choices, but the choices that they make don't reflect our long-term interests. The choices that they make reflect only the short-term gains that will be made, uh, sometimes for the population and other times for the, the, the uh, uh, government. So um, 
I conclude by simply saying that it's important that uh, we think about uh, these kinds of uh, discussions, that in our own countries, whether we're from Malawi, from Zambia, from Tanzania, Uganda, we think about it when we make those choices, choices about what needs to be done now and what needs to be done in future, we'll be thinking more and more about uh, uh, the, the long term. We'll be thinking about the gains for the entire nation uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, as opposed to what will happen four years from now. Thank you very much. Thank you.